Hello wonderful Year 10 students and welcome to this week's work and this week we'll be focusing on Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem The Charge of the Light Brigade. The retrieving feedback from the previous week there won't be a retrieval quiz this week because I feel you've all got a good grasp, really strong grasp in fact of the skills required to do well in paper on question five so I felt I'd just be asking you questions for the sake of it so what I'll be doing is over the course of the week, providing everyone with individual feedback, um, mainly on those question five extracts that you've created, but over previous work um, over the last week or so. What we'll be looking at today is context reading, annotating the poem, developing an understanding of meter, wonderful meter in this poem called dactylic meter. And then I want you to do another dramatic reading. Um, I think that's important for this poem. It's a poem that really lends itself very well to that. The first thing that I want you to do though today is using this tutorial effectively do this as a kind of do now task at home and take um, five to ten minutes to do this. Now in a minute you'll be able to see um, these three images on individual slides and therefore just pause those slides so you can have a look at them properly and consider these paintings. What words best describe them? What big ideas are explored? How are the soldiers in the paintings portrayed? Make notes on your sheet and be prepared to share your ideas. Now obviously you won't be sharing ideas necessarily you don't have to submit anything to me on this but I think it would be a useful thing um, for you to think about and engage with. So if we look at the first image very much the kind of view of the heroic cavalryman. If we look at the dress, the attire, the appearance of the horse just have a think about how is this presenting heroism, how is this presenting um, the idea of war as something noble and heroic and terrifying. How realistic do you find it? Then the next image. So again, um, if you look closely, the horses are near identical in terms of imagery as are the men. And then you have these occasional sort of hatless figures around as well. You know, what is being demonstrated here? What do the clouds in the background represent? So all these things are, are things to think about with a painting like this, the mixture of darkness and light, the prominence of certain colours, all these kind of things, things to think about, try and develop your idea. That image, um, again, just gives you some developmental ideas and things to think about there. And again, you can pause that in the PowerPoint, but I've gone a little bit fast there. The reason I wanted to do this poem this week is I felt with so much of the discussion around history that's prominent in in the media and in the world at the moment and the nature and meaning and significance of history. This is a poem with a substantial history about the Crimean War between Britain and Imperial Russia. It is a hearkening back to Britain's imperial past and it was also the first um, war to really be recorded and reported properly in the newspapers. So again, it's the, the first nature of reportage in the war and information in the war. So again, this kind of element of history is really, really important when studying this poem. And it's interesting, I suppose, that the poem is, is, so, is so poetical, is so figurative about the nature of war, whereas this is one of the first wars that we get reported properly and people start to get a real sense of the horror rather than the kind of heroism associated Looking at the poem itself, as you can see, the very, very um, powerful rhythmic structure. This way, I want you to do a dramatic reading of this this week as well. And again, if you just want to do it as a straight reading, that's absolutely fine. But again, if you want to try and do something more interesting and more developed, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, again, you see all the kind of dramatic aspects of it that we have the power of lots of anaphora in these kind of phrases here. Um, the refrain and just how it subtly alters each time. Road the 600, road, road, not the 600, left of 600, noble 600, these little subtle changes here. Biblical references such as into the valley of death. And again, this, this real kind of poetic drama in these phrases here, and you'll see a very particular structure which is called dactylic dimeter, which I'm going to go through a little bit more in detail as we go through the poem. So it, it has a certain dynamism, a certain drama. It's it's a real kind of um, 
sort of favourite of the Victorian schoolboy type poem because it does present war and defeat and death in war as, as a kind of heroic noble failure as opposed to a catastrophe, as opposed to something horrendous. If you look at the nature of death and the nature of injury, um, we have the word shattered and sundered, but there's no sense of, you know, kind of immediate physical danger here. There's there's vague sense, while horse and hero fell, they that had fought so well. So again, this idea they that had fought so well, what's happened here is it's a cavalry charge into a series of cannons, which decimate the light brigade. They haven't had the chance to fight well. So it's, it's all these kind of close reading things that you want to get into and think about when reading this poem. So the guidance um, notes here, and I've put the PowerPoint up in just a normal way. I'm pointing with my pen at it as if you can see me, that's just an instinct, um, apologies. So a variety of questions to guide you through some annotation. Again, you don't have to follow these. These are just a guide. But if you don't follow them, then you need to make sure your annotation is still purposeful and useful and really, really helpful and, and a strong piece of work. So just think about that as you go through it. And again, you can pause these slides just to give you some further guidance on each of the lines and think about the nature of these things here. OK, so moving on. The nature of metre here. So the main metre that we've studied is iambic pentameter. And we had a lot of fun in inverted commas about the nature of feet in poetry and the metre. And I think this is really well explained by Stuart Pryke here in terms of the work he's done on poetry. So the way that this poem is structured, as you can see, is that you have three syllable sections here, four wood, the light brigade. So four wood, the light brigade. So you have a long syllable and two short ones. And these are called dactyls. Long was the uh, man is made. So, you know, I'm overemphasizing for impact there. But again, look at the syllables that are emphasized each time. And again, the power. And then what the rhythm is here is dum da da, dum da da. And think about the nature of what that imitates. Well, it's meant to imitate, isn't it, the physical charge of the cavalry moving towards the guns. Some more specifics about these. These little groups of syllables between the slash are called feet. A stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables, we call that a dactyl. Whereas remember an I am that you've studied goes unstressed, stressed, da dum. So two feet per line, that's diameter, whereas you've studied pentameter when there's five feet a line and dactyl. So each line of this poem only has six syllables. So again, perhaps Tennyson uses rhythm to mirror the thundering of the hooves, the horses, it never falters, just like the soldiers. It creates this continual dum da da, dum da da, dum da da, dum da da rhythm and power. And again, that's another reason why I want you to create a dramatic reading for it, because the poem lends itself to naturally. I think those of you who are musically skilled or just musically ambitious, you know, can have a lot of fun engaging with this poem and creating something really interesting and beautiful. So the last thing I want you to think about with this poem is the nature of pro or anti-war. Now, this is quite a binary way of putting this and, you know, as a group of young people, you're more complex in your thinking than this. And again, this isn't something I want you to report back to me. This is just something I want you to be thinking about, that you have a negative portrayal of war, um, the nature of the valley of death that they're going into, the idea of poor leadership, someone had blundered, and then equally sort of glorifying the nature of war, the valley of death could be seen in the same way as glorifying war, that they're going into something, a kind of magnificent death, as opposed to a, a terrifying and horrendous one, boldly they rode and well. All those kind of phrases create this sense of something beautiful, something amazing, the way they're described at the end, noble 600. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the way we refer to people as heroes, now there's a very common association between military referencing and heroes because 
of the very particular nature. Um, obviously, you know, we're living in a culture at the moment where all sorts of people are being referred to as heroes. Many of those people, I think, would just prefer to be seen as, as expert professionals going about their job. Whereas hero, um, which is from heros, which is a Greek word um, that we get from dramatic poems like the Odyssey and the Iliad, is this idea of this this great sort of mythological character who is who embodies particular kinds of values. You know, are these men heroes in that sense? They're certainly incredibly brave. Um, they're certainly very committed to a cause, and they're certainly going to follow orders. But does that mean their actions are are to be glorified or to be pitied? And again, it's it's. It's easy to talk about these things considerably outside the context. The Crimean War was fought in 1854. It's now 2020. It's very difficult to just map the feelings and sensations and beliefs of one generation onto another. So this is a, a very simple grid, but I want you to kind of think about it in more complex ways. You know, you know, to be pro or anti war, what, what does that even mean? You know, can we ever reduce things to such simple dynamics? Um, you know, life is complex. History is very complex. It doesn't fit itself into these kind of neat grids. These are all things to be thinking about while you're annotating and reading the poems this week. So good luck with this work and I hope you find the this video useful. I'm going to do a couple more um, short pieces to just help you guide you through the work and have an enjoyable week, everyone. And I'll very much hopefully see some of you very soon. All right. Take care. Bye bye.